My guest today is Tibi Kovac. Tibi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Hi, David. Uh, hi, thanks for inviting me into your home here. It's a beautiful home. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And you're I don't know if I've welcome. told you this, that uh, you have a beautiful family. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But you already knew that. Yes, I knew that. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. Then. Let's do that, yes. Something I, what, uh, what do you want to talk about? So, uh, I got passionate about about cloud, like many other people. Sure, lately. me too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but what I'm doing actually a lot lately is helping um, helping a lot of um, custo- of, our, of our customers moving to moving to the cloud. So when you say moving, meaning that they already have some application running locally. So actually, that, that's an interesting thing because we have different different type of customers. There are customers that are completely new to uh, to cloud, mm-hmm. so they have their own apps on prem, and we are talking about everything from. You know, a couple of hundred apps still, uh, we have customers with about 10,000 applications that need to be moved to to Azure. And mm-hmm. yeah, indeed. And then we have um, customers that I really like the, the, you know, the, the way they put it when I talk with them, they ha- they they are they want to move from the bad cloud to the good cloud. The bad cloud. What's the bad cloud? So Let's the bad that. cloud is a cloud that they they start is actually moving to. So there is no. I'm not. Does it start with an A? No, no, no. I, I'm not talking about a specific <laughs> a specific uh, provider. I'm talking about the way they actually made the first move to to. Oh, so they moved to the cloud, to, but they the didn't cloud. do yes. it right. They didn't do it right. They had no governance in place. They okay. had no no structure. They had a lot of things, and they. You know, and to be honest, at the, at the time when they started, there were no too many best practices, and a lot mm. of customers found them, themselves in a situation when they had to, you know, they had to to, to try to fill the water, okay. and some of them actually, you know, uh, got it wrong. I would say, okay, uh, fair enough. and even if they did, I mean, and uh, for some of them, it was not even their own fault because that was what what was recommended from, you know, from the people that should have known better. Uh, me mm-hmm. included at some point, you know, like if you look at... We're all uh, trying to figure it out. It's exactly. Still a so, relatively new technology. Exactly. So it, because it was a new technology, like one of the recommendations was put everything in separate subscriptions. And you get customers now with hundreds of subscriptions and they feel it's hmm. impossible to manage. So yeah. they want to move to a more uh, controlled environment. So oh. they want to move to, to smaller and then they need to have, you know, connections between them. So it is, uh, it is interesting anyway. So. Yeah. Uh, so I think so. I'm guessing that one of the problems that people had is they moved to the cloud, but they continued building applications in exactly the same way that they were on premise. Exactly. So for many people, the cloud uh, in general is just a, a different data center, yeah. which I think you know. In some ways, it is, but in it's some not ways, 100% it is. True. But I think the biggest challenge or the biggest uh, you know the biggest miss here is the fact that if you still use it as a different data center, you miss the all those built-in services that you you know like. The, all the many services, all the platform as a service and software as a service okay. offerings that you have, because yeah. those are actually helping you to do a better job than what what uh, what you're doing. And I think we, uh, historically speaking, we've done the same mistake many times over. Like it's not it, you know if it's not invented here or if it's not something that we developed ourselves, okay. it doesn't feel like a technology that I can really trust one hundred percent. Sure. Or I'll pr- I'll phrase it another way: If I've already got a database server that I've configured exactly the way I wanted to, yeah. why do I need database as a service? Why do I need that platform as a service? The, it's already it's a problem already been solved. In a way, yes, but okay. in another way, you don't have the backup. You don't. You need them okay. to do the manual management of the of the thing. Well, my engineers have already figured out the backup. We have backups. We have. Uh, but they still need. They still need to to rotate the tapes, don't they? Yes. They still need to do all this <laughs> manual work, and I think you know, as an engineer, why would I do the mechanical work when I can actually do something smarter? I can actually improve the way I'm doing my job. It's still. I'm still. I don't think we are going to be out of job just because we move to a managed solution. Right. But there are solutions that are, you know, that are perfect for being automated. Mm-hmm. So I'm, mean, you know, like yeah, we're talking about automation and AI taking over the world. What they are taking over are those mechanical steps, all those things that, you know, are easy to be automated. But right. there are a lot of things that we are still actually, as humans, I think we can still come with better ideas and solve and solve business problems in a more elegant and more uh, more nice way. Yeah, now that question was kind of a setup. I, I think about, oh, okay. I could certainly go out and grow my own food and raise yeah, oh, my yeah. own animals yeah. and kill them and make food yeah. out of them. Yeah. Uh, but that's not very efficient. Maybe right. I should let farmers yeah. do that, yeah. and then I could spend my time doing things that I'm good at, yeah. make money at that, and then and then buy the food from the farmers. And and this is kind of the similar thing, right? We're, we're letting exactly. I, 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 if I outsource those backups, yeah. 
now I can focus on the things that I do well, things that are my expertise. So another analogy I'm using, it's actually the one with, with electricity. Okay. So like how many people are producing their own electricity? Very few. And right. how many people are really off the grid? Like, mm -hmm. no, most people are actually still connected to the grid, even, even if they have their own electricity. Mm -hmm. then, but when you produce your own electricity, one of the biggest challenges is actually that you need a consumer. You need to do something with, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with whatever you get over. So it's the same like with the, with the data center. Yes, you get the data center, but it always means that you have to pay extra stuff for, you know, right. for just to be on the safe side to make sure that you have enough uh, capacity in case that your business demands that. And that leads to, you know, underutilization of the hardware that you're paying for. Mm -hmm. So using a, you know, using a cloud solution, I would say, would help you exactly with those kind of challenges. All right. Uh, so what kind of recommendations can you give when people are moving an application to the cloud? So I think there are now mo uh, like, like, you know, there are documentations is widespread now. So you get a lot of you get a lot of recommendations. I would look into recommendations coming directly from the vendors, both Microsoft and AWS. Yeah, but they I'm, have, I'm going to talk about your specific customers. You know, so you, what I'm doing company. actually right now, I'm trying. So one of the, the one of my uh, key recommendations is education. Uh -huh. So, I mean, yes, I can talk with you about technology, I can tell you what you need to do, but if your people are not ready to move because they feel, you know, unprepared or obsolete or uneducated about the technology that they are going to embark into, then that, that is going to be an issue in the long term anyway. So you want to make sure that they get educated the right way. Okay. And then I'm, I'm trying to understand, so of course there are a lot of recommendations, but I'm trying to understand how the business is actually working at the moment and how can you make sure that you are not you know if you're moving to the cloud uh you still you're still able to follow the same governance rules you're still able to make sure that you know if if we decided on something on certain processes and how things should be working then we can continue and, and doing that uh, you know uh, doing that as well for you know when we move to the cloud okay and of course looking and i think for for a lot of companies now because you know well, we are talking about the second waves of of cloud adoptions for a lot of companies now, this second wave became as a you know as a very good opportunity to clean up the house. You know that we have thousands of applications, maybe not thousands, but out of like I mentioned, a customer with almost ten thousand applications. I think about ten percent of them are you know are applications that can be easily you know they can easily get rid of not using them or just buy an off the shelf solution yeah. and they don't have to worry about all those things and oh my god it's an it's an uh, aged hardware I need to do something about it mm -hmm. you just buy the solution for someone else and you start using sure. it or maybe somebody else's maybe they took their departments have created the exactly. same solution yes you merge them yes. Um, the things you're talking about, platform as a service and software yes. as a service, uh, is it um, is it possible? Do, do people have to re-architect their application to start using Depen these services, or can they just lift them and shift them so, and put them so, in VMs and containers? So the theory says that it's very easy to move it. The practice, most of the times, is a little bit you know it's a little bit different, and the reason for that is mainly because the way we used to do things so like everything we you know like there was no automation until recently everything we had to do we had to do manually so i would install an application i put it on a server and then i had somewhere some you know some papers that would say what are the next steps that i need to do in order to make it work on that particular machine i remember that word document yeah you know so that's that was the thing you had the step-by-step -step documentation to tell you how you make this application work which is you know error prone mm -hmm. it's stupid you know uh -huh. and yeah, non repeatable. Non repeatable. Like yeah. you have to do the same steps. You have to apply them over and over again. Yeah. And I'm at that level of, of laziness that I hate doing the same thing twice. If I know there is a risk to do something twice, I would rather code it and then you know it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. But then I, I know for a fact that I can do exactly the same thing without having to remember. Oh, what were the steps that I took? Was it here to the left or was it to the right that I did over there? And how how did I do it? So that's why I'm saying you know it it sounds. You know, like if you talk with a, with a sales guy or a marketing guy, they will tell you, yeah, yeah, you just take one and put it and you take it from here, you put it there and that's it. <laughs> Sounds easy. Exactly. But as a technologist, I, you know, when, when it comes to technology, I can see that, okay, so we need to figure out what else it was in there, why it's not working. Now, you know, we, we see that we did, we did how, how the documentation said, mm -hmm. we moved X to Y and then it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's why I need to go back and try to understand. So yeah, that's when... 
talking with an application owner, you might actually get an idea about, yeah. oh, those were the documents that we needed to use, and those were the things that we needed to have in, in order to, to make it work. Uh, maybe that, that automation process becomes part of that documentation, because so, now you're not relying on uh, a Word document or somebody's memory. Exactly. So that's one of the things that I've, I see actually uh, getting a very, uh, you know, very big stronghold is the, um, is the infrastructure as a code and all those DevOps practices. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes I laugh at it because I, I mean, I've been doing both ops and dev for so long, it uh -huh. feels like it feels like it's a forced term in my, you know, in, oh, DevOps, in my yeah. opinion, the DevOps. But at the same time, yeah, I can understand that there, there is always this disconnect between what a developer is doing and what the operations was doing and we always had to communicate sure. with them. So of course, you know, that communication was, you know, was a bit of an issue. So now I'm seeing, I'm seeing that for a developer, sometimes it seems a little bit easier to move towards a DevOps thinking, mm -hmm. mainly because everything we have to do now in DevOps, it's a lot of coding. And okay. the challenge I've seen with the IT people, it's like, oh, then I need to know more PowerShell. I need to know more okay. scripting. I need to know more about programming. And mm -hmm. that, that's what makes it a little bit uh, harder. Yeah, I think uh, it's, this struck a nerve in me that uh, when you just talk about how painful it is to do these manual processes, yeah. that was a big reason why people in the past haven't deployed very often. Yeah, oh, because of who wants to do something that's painful? And I think but if you've got automated and repeatable and less error prone, then it's less painful, and you're encouraged yeah. to deploy more often. More often, which means catch bugs faster, uh, get code out faster, get feedback faster. All those advantages happen. And think about the other aspect of, of the things that people know. I, I don't think a lot of people are thinking about it this way. But when you are bound to a certain uh, hardware platform, uh -huh. it means that you are going to be bound to a certain version of a certain software. Like, oh yeah, we can't run .NET Framework 4.5 because our IT, our IT department haven't installed it on any of the production servers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, when you have an infrastructure as a, as a code, you know, and everything gets coded, so you do no manual work whatsoever, that's, uh, that's at least what you should strive to. That's what, you know, this should be your, you know, your end goal. Whenever I'm deploying something, everything from my infrastructure to the code that I'm deploying on it, everything should be done in an automated fashion, because then I know for a fact that if I want to add, you know, like, oh, we got .NET Core 3.1 the other week, Mm -hmm. So if I want to do a .NET 3.1 in, you know, in the old world would have been impossible because yeah, we haven't had time to test it. And if you look at our calendar, it means that we only get time, you know, like next year around, <laughs> around Christmas. And then, yeah, by that time we get .NET 4, 5.0 or something. So it's always, you know, the chasing the tail kind of thing mm -hmm. that we're doing. So having infrastructure as a code and making sure you get everything you need on the server as a code, mm -hmm. I can, you know, I get the disposable infrastructure sure makes it easy to set up a staging yeah. environment to do that kind of test testing. it run it go with it and say okay if it works okay then we have it if not you know dispose of it i didn't have to invest thousands of dollars to buy hardware just to test some things and then oh i couldn't use it because x or y good uh what else should we talk about on this on this path of migrating to the cloud or have we covered it pretty well so I think it's, you know, it's the, if you want to get started, I think that's, you know, that, that's a good place things, to get started. Yeah, and I, well, I know that you're, uh, you're speaking a lot and yeah. you're publishing a lot. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. Share that with the audience. So I'm, I'm speaking at conferences and I actually lately I've, I've been doing two types of talks. Uh, one of them was actually the state of .NET, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that I, you know, it's um, originally developed by, by uh, Mike, Marco Seger and Code mm -hmm. Magazine. And oh, then Code Magazine. Yeah, it just ended, didn't it? No, Code, not Code. MSDN ended. Oh, okay. Good. Code, code sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, no, sorry, no, Marcus. Code, 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 I didn't mean yeah. to sound your death knell. Code is actually the it's one that, that 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 it's it's the last one standing. Okay, and I right. think you know, and I think Marcus, hi Marcus, <laughs> is um is committed to actually do it for uh, for the long run okay, anyway good. because I think you know he really likes the idea of a physical pay, you okay, know like a enough. magazine. <laughs> I misspoke. Uh, yeah. But no, so so they took or originally they took out the, this uh, this talk and uh, it's about I think you know I I did it from forty five minutes to a four hours workshop so you can do it in you know in this um, uh, so you can do an eyes front breakout presentation or you can have the audience involved exactly so when we did so 
I went and then I got involved in, in it and then we did it together a bunch of times and then oh, you we and do it. Did. Yes. Okay. And then we do it each and you know in, in different parts of the world and you know if I go at a conference and I, they want me I can do that too or I do tours of um, user groups and meetups in you know in Europe mostly. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting talk and it's a live one. So every time I, I I, I I did that. I had to update the, the slide deck, so it's not it, it's not an, you know it's not some kind of a talk that you, you give it once and then it's the same one over right. and over again. And then the other the what the other one that I'm doing and I really like is actually the the services that every developer should know the cloud services that every developer should know. And you know once going and talking about that is like stuff like web applications. You need to know how you deploy a web application mm -hmm. because. Once you understand that, it becomes much easier for you to take your application and not being dependent on a on an IaaS server. Mm -hmm. The second service that I'm talking about is a database as a you know the, the database as a service, and again helps you a lot with uh, right. with all those things. And I talked about stuff like Key Vault for keeping secrets. Mm -hmm. I talk about storage as a way to actually. Uh, uh, bring you know static uh, assets and get a better performance. Okay, your so if you're if you're brand yeah. new to the cloud, then these are exactly you're, you're, you're those be overwhelmed are the with the yes. hundreds of offerings. Here's the, the ten or so that you need. Exactly. All right. So yeah, and, and you also is, have a, a course coming up on LinkedIn Learning. Is that it? Yeah, on LinkedIn Learning, I will do a course about uh, actually continuous feedback on Azure DevOps. Excellent. I've done uh, courses on uh, ASP.NET Web Forms. Believe it or not, it's still a popular piece of technology. I'm aware of that, yep. Web form, so that, that's the still thing. Still in production. Yes, yeah, still in I'm, production. I'm embarrassed to say. Yeah, no, but it's, <laughs> it's actually it's a working technology. Works, so you yeah. know, like if you don't have a business case for moving away from it, why why would you? you know? I agree. So yeah, I, I I'm doing those kind of things too. Tibby, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. <laughs>